Ahoy, you filthy scallywags. Welcome to Under the Crossbones, episode 210. I'm Nick Hoffman. I'm your host. Today's guest is the Pirate Round. It's a couple made up of uh, Thomas and Delaney Anderson. And they're a couple of good people that will be talking to us about what they do. They have a Facebook page that uh, shares pirate facts and information. They review some rum. And uh, they also do uh, This Day in History. So if you sign up for their page, which I totally think you should, just go like it. Uh, then you'll start to see This Day in Pirate History, which they do each and every day. And they're lovely people. Hey, how are you today? I hope you're doing well. I hope this show finds you in good spirits. I need to share with you uh, a little bit of information about our sponsor. Under the Crossbones is sponsored by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, WKKC-DB, playing the best music of today's hits and yesterday's classics. Under the Crossbone is on Wednesdays at 10, or they may have shifted that recently. Go ahead and check that out. Check their schedule. Uh, To listen to Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, you can uh, go to them at pirateradioofthetreasurecoast.com, or you can also listen to them on Live 365 app. Uh, just search for Pirate Radio, uh, which, by the way, you can search for us as well, I think. Uh, or you can ask Alexa or the Google device to play Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, and it will start playing it for you. Find out more about it or to tune in and listen, go to Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast. Dot com. Hey, speaking of sponsorship, you know what else you can do? We have a little widget right there, a little button you can press from our page. So if you listen from our page, go ahead to the top. If you have a hankering to get something on Amazon, you should go to the Amazon link that's on our page and shop for whatever it is you want. And then when you buy that, we get just a little bit of cash ourselves. Very t- super, super tiny. But Uh, The gesture is much appreciated, and we will thank you forever. Uh, We won't know that you did it. I won't know that you did it, but uh, apparently it shows up in an account somewhere. Uh, We transfer it from Switzerland. Uh, It goes through uh, three different things, and then we get it. No, I'm kidding. I I, I don't actually know how it works. Uh, That's the beauty of this. I I just, it doesn't. Please do it. Do it. Do it anyway, and uh, I'll love you forever. Hey, speaking of episode 210 and number 210, I don't have a super fascinating fact for you about 210, but I will tell you at six foot three, that's my goal weight. Yeah, 210, 220, that's the goal. That's where I'd like to be. Uh, I'm a long ways from that. Uh, It's kind of like you have a map in front of you and you can see that off in the distance on the map. You know that it's on the map. You just can't imagine getting to it. (laughs) I can imagine getting to it. I've lost some weight. Things are good. In fact, I'll share this with you. Went to my doctor uh, not not too long ago, uh, within the last week or so, and I had a electrocardio no echocardiogram. That's what it was. So uh, they put the little electrodes on me, and then they did a sonogram as though I'm pregnant, although I am not. But they were looking for a picture of my heart, and uh, they recorded that. And then my doctor went ahead and took a look at it. And then I saw him a week later and he was so dang chipper. I had not seen him that happy for a long time. And he said, congratulations, you have a normal looking echocardiogram. So what he said was, and he he was trying to uh, share this with a new colleague who had just come aboard at their office and uh, to explain to her what why that was such a good thing. He explained to her all the things that were wrong with my heart before when we first met. And, uh, and that list was long. I honestly, I don't think I was holding quite so many, uh, of those facts that he shared with her, which is maybe good. It would make it hard to get out of bed safely. And, uh, but then when he said, but now it's uh, normal, everything's beaten like it's supposed to, uh, that made me very happy. So that, that's great news. And, uh, that's, that's what we're going for. Okay. So, uh, you guys are awesome. I'm so glad you're here today and I'm so glad you, uh, you reach out for things like pirates because this is, this is what I do. This is the thing I'm interested in. Um, I have a a project I'm working on. I'll share more facts as it comes available, 
but uh, it's a character that I'm working on that I, uh, is, I'm going to write some books from that character's point of view. And, uh, I'm also going to, uh, create a page as well as, uh, videos and a little show I can share with you, but that is in the future. But I wanted to tell you so that there was a fire under my butt to make that happen. Uh, because you know, if I don't have a fire under my butt, <laughs> that thing's never going to cook anyway. So episode 210, the pirate round, I am about to share with you, uh, Thomas and Delaney Anderson, great people. I think you'll have a big fun time. Enjoy the pirate round. Here you go. Tom and Delaney, this is Nick Hoffman. It's so nice to have you here. Welcome to the program. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Why don't uh, one or both of you go ahead and explain what the pirate round is? So the pirate round is is kind of a twofold thing. We have a YouTube site and a Facebook site. And the Facebook site actually started off as kind of the carrying device for the YouTube site. Now, the pirate round is a... Initially, what it was designed for was we were going to do nothing but rum reviews as pirates, because pirates love rum. And as we toyed with what we wanted to call this adventure, Tom came up with the pirate round, because the pirate round has multiple meanings. First of all, having a round of drinks, rum, and we're pirates. The second was... um, having a round table, kind of a discussion. So pirates having this discussion. And the third and final is the pirate round being what pirates did, or some of the pirates, like Henry Avery, Thomas II. um, Those are two of the most famous ones. uh, William Kidd, who sailed from usually the New World into the Caribbean, across to Africa, around the tip of Africa, into the Indian Ocean, and then back home. And as we decided later on, you know, it's like, let's not just do rum. That's kind of boring. Let's talk anything pirate related. So the YouTube site is pretty much we do a video every Friday that can be anything from rum reviews, which are kind of popular, to anything pirate games, uh, books, movies, um, history, anything along that lines. And then the Facebook site as kind of the carrying device for where we post the video, not just on YouTube, but on Facebook. We also do every Friday or every day we do a, uh, this day in pirate history, which is from the seven or 1500s to the 1750s. And then every Friday we do a pirate of the week. And we usually do the small lesser known pirates, the guys you never hear about like William fly and some of those guys. And how long have you guys been doing this? Just about a year now. Yeah, a little over a year, I think. And did you? Uh, who did, who did the uh, opening credit sequence on your videos? It was actually kind of a team effort, and the whole everything is designed by us. We're so we're self funded. Nobody gives us anything. Stuff we had, and uh, we decided we wanted to do the stop motion. So uh, as I was moving the little ship, Tom would do clicking of the camera and moving of the camera to kind of make it swing around. And then the claymation was stuff that I put together and then animated as, uh, as we were going. So he would take the picture and I would move the, the creatures a little bit and, and uh, take another shot and, and then we'd just put it all together. It was kind of a fun project. We eventually want to redo it probably, you know, in a couple months or so. Now that's about, I think the openings are almost a minute long, isn't it? Yep, it's about a minute long. And I'm I'm not going to do all the math, but at 24 frames a second, give or take, how uh how long during during a day or two did it take you to make all that? Um probably I don't know, what do you think Tom? What was it about? Well, it, it took us a good long afternoon to do most of the shots. And we were taking one, you know, we took uh you know, you take a shot and then we would just move like the ship, just, you know, a millimeter or two and then another one and another one and another one. And I think we ended up taking six or 700 shots and trying to edit it into <laughs> this, you know, trying to, cause I know we swapped chips and batteries several times on the phone, try to, to try to get things done like that. 
And uh, we were playing with the lighting, you know, because we wanted a golden light to kind of look sure. like a, a golden map. And, and uh, we, you know, we looked and looked for a map and we couldn't find the right kind of map. So we just ended up drawing a map and then uh, <laughs> illustrating it and everything. So we had a, you know, kind of an old looking map and we had to kind of match the golden color with the lighting because we didn't want it to look cold and bluish. So it had to be kind of a, kind of a daylight looking lighting. And we played with that. And then eventually we uh, delineated it all up uh, pretty much. So you shot that with your phone, more high end camera. It's okay. Kind of entry level with a Nikon D 5,200 and just doing one photo gotcha. at a time. And there was, there was times we actually had to go back and it's like, Oh, we made a mistake here and had to go back and, and start again. And so when it came to going through all the photos, I had to find which ones were, the same and which ones where we stopped and had to go back and holy moly it's i i was very impressed by that uh, I, as a kid uh we had a little eight millimeter uh film camera i remember doing a stop motion thing on my driveway that you know because the sun is passing from one side to the other and i shot from probably mid-morning till late afternoon you can see the shadows changing and i think the whole thing was probably a minute 20 it had to have taken seven hours i'm not that disciplined now uh then then as a little kid i'm amazed i was able to hold that together i'd never done anything like that and it was kind of fun and kind of a learning experience yeah i mean we're all you know we're fans of different sorts of you know creative processes and stuff and i've always loved like claymation and stop action I really love like the Wallace and Gromit movies, you know, how they're just kind of put together. Yeah. And I thought when we were trying to figure out an introduction, I thought, why don't we just go ahead and do like a stop action, like miniatures, because we've got all these miniature ships and, you know, we can put like a little squid in there and some gunfire using some cotton. And I've got some blinky lights that we have, some little bitty blinky lights. We can make it look like cannon shots and stuff like that. So when we started experimenting with it, you know, it ended up looking pretty good. And so then we just decided to go ahead and do the whole thing like that. Total amateurs, you can tell by how the camera moves from side to side. You know, it's just kind of goofy how we couldn't keep it on the tripod correctly. But in the end, it ended up looking pretty good. Oh, I know. It's, it's great. I applaud your effort on that. And it is a, a challenging and daunting endeavor. So it, it really did come out great. And, and so had you done that before you kicked everything off? Or did that come a little bit after you started? After we talked about what we were going to do, we we actually did some test run of it just to, to see how it was going to work without having all the claymation and everything else. I had to get the clay and and then make you know bunches of different models for for the like the whale when the whale's coming up uh-huh. and getting them to look halfway right and the the squid you know the first couple of squids that I did weren't quite right so I'd mush them together and you know redo them all and the tentacles and everything coming up so that was that was once we got the ship part figured out how we wanted to do it and how it was going to work. Uh, the claymation was the, the final add in part. So yeah, it, it, it's great. Anyway, I, I, I don't know how much uh, my listeners will be uh, impressed by the chat of behind the scenes on claymation, but I love it. So don't, so we're not going to uh, worry about uh, <laughs> who isn't into it, which is fine. So what, um, Let's ask some general questions about some of the content that you've already done. What, what's what been your favorite sort of lesser-known pirate that you've covered? William Fly was probably the, the, the first one because there was, a, there was actually a book about William Fly. It was quite interesting. But on the, the YouTube channel, we haven't hit much upon the pirates. You know, we talk a little bit about some of the smaller ones. But we did uh, a piece on Blackbeard, which actually was one of our favorites, which came about as a discussion between Tom and I, which is a what if pirates were really like an insurance fraud. They were on the take. <laughs> and it's quite an interesting thing that we, we started talking. It's like, what if they really were working with the governors, you know, to to steal and, and, you know, everyone was getting their cut and the merchantmen were actually getting their cut, you know, claiming insurance and, and everything else at that time. Because, like, you know, there was some of that. So that was probably one of, of one of our favorites. We usually hold the, the channel to, to some of the more bigger name pirates. We did a, a long piece on Anne and Mary, two of my favorite pirates. We've done a piece on Tom's favorite, um, Henry Avery. Henry Avery, yeah. Right. Uh-huh. And then uh, one of our friends who joins us, uh, Kent Turner, uh, wanted to do one on, uh, what was his name? 
Well, they did Sir Francis Drake. I know they wanted to talk about him. He was more of a privateer. We we didn't do much on on sure. Sir Francis Drake. We've just kind of hit upon him. Um, well, we did like Jean Lafitte too. Yeah, Jean Lafitte, yeah. which was kind of out of our time frame because we tried to hit upon the 1500s to the 1750s, right, really before the Golden Age of pir- piracy, and then right after the Golden Age of piracy. But it was all piracy, and you know, it's all fun, and and uh, that's what our friend Kent wanted to talk about, and. So we accommodate him when he comes up. It's like, you know, what would you want to talk about today? And But we have plans to do, you know, other pirates. Um, we want to do uh, Sir Francis Drake. Tom's got uh, a Comorian helmet, which is like what Francis Drake wore. And we both used to do Renaissance fairs. So we had to have the noble clothing and we want to do a whole thing on him. And Tom will dress up as Francis Sir Francis Drake. I had done a, a pirate exhibit. And one of the things I added to the exhibit, I, there was a hobby shop nearby and on certain Saturdays of the month, they had a wood shipbuilding group. And I thought, oh, it'd be great if I could have that in the exhibit, some of these ships, because these guys were doing extraordinary work. And so I went and I, I gave a pitch to what I wanted to do with the exhibit and mentioned that, you know, if any of you, and, and a lot of them were looking at me rather suspiciously, I said, if any of you want to you know, put these in a display case so that we can show them off. That would be great. Well, none of those codgers were interested, but, um, (laughs) one, one guy had come up to me afterwards and said, you know, I have some, uh, period coins and, um, uh, a cannonball from, from uh, close to the period. And I have some material about Sir Francis Drake. And then he looked at me and he looked so serious. He said, but if you call him a pirate in your exhibit, I will yank my stuff out of that exhibit right away. I mean, he, he was, he was so, I swear to you, if, if I had let it slip, he'd have punched me in the face. That guy. probably, Yeah. And you know, it's funny because, uh, I, uh, I, so I included that information. Having the coins was great. Having a cannonball was amazing. And I had a, a big picture of Sir Francis Drake. And because this was in Northern California, we had a connection to Drake. So, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. yeah. So, so I was excited to put him in there. And in, in my opinion, um, certainly there were folks of the period, they'd probably be Spanish that would have, that would suggest that he was a pirate, uh, because right. oh, there were times yeah. that he did yeah. things, a li- he colored a little yeah. outside the lines, you know? <laughs> Oh, yeah. and, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but but I was careful not to do that. Um, I, I suppose in a way you could call him. I mean, you know, the Spanish certainly called him a pirate, and I think probably if you looked at his definition now, he would he would still be considered a pirate, even though he did have a legal privateering contract to go make war against the Spanish. Even though at that time the English weren't even really officially at war, they still had this kind of cold war going back and forth between them and this rivalry because of the, you know, the difficulties with the armada and everything and that sort. And, uh, you know, by strict definition, he probably, you know, is a pirate, but of course, because he had a legal contract that everybody still says, well, he's a privateer and there's a difference. You know, there right. is a difference, but still, I mean, by strict definition, he probably was a pirate. <laughs> by the way, I, I think your guys's uh, discussion about the idea that, Maybe folks were on the take and uh, it was more of an insurance scam. I don't think you're that far off, probably in a fair number of cases. Yeah. Yeah. It's a kind of a vague idea I got from the writer, uh, Patrick Pringle. Uh, he has a book, you know, under, I think it's called Under the Under the Black Flag or Skull and Bones. I can't remember exactly what the book is. It's an older book, but he talks about how some of these pirates were, could have been in league with some of these ship captains and these governors to where they would defraud the uh, the, the uh, insurance carriers in London as a way to get hard cash and currency, you know, pushed into the colonies by, you know, by pulling their money, you know, out of these, out of these insurance claims and then turning around and selling the goods for extra money on top and right. uh, make, you know, making out like bandits, you know, where everybody literally. gets a cut. Yeah. Literally, you know, where everybody gets a <laughs> cut except the insurance people who are bilked out of it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's great. And and certainly even if they weren't in league with the ship's captains, there's you know, they were definitely in league with half the governors. So Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the the governors were not always entirely upset when these things took place until of course the tides turned and then True. Uh, 
and then they had to get serious. Yeah, we want to do a show on corrupt governors. Uh, we're trying to get a list together of of various uh, governors that have probably been on the take. You know, that we could talk about how much they benefited by uh, their trade with these so-called pirates. You know, who've actually made their fortune trading with these governors. It's pretty interesting. I can't remember the um the author, and of course, at this moment, I'll probably screw up the title. But it seems like there's a book called Pirate Hives or something like that, which speaks specifically to the topic of that piracy existed almost entirely because uh, the legal folks uh, necessitated it and, uh, and, and provided opportunities for the pirates to have places to sell, uh, passed along information, et cetera. Oh, was that called Pirate Havens? I want to, I thought Hive was part of the name, but I, I could be wrong. And, you know, uh, the beauty of editing is, is no, I, I probably won't change this, but uh, <laughs> you know, I could just replace the word and then, uh, you know, but then I'd have to get you guys in on it. I'm not going to go through all that, but, uh, I don't know. We'll look it up. And when I, when I think of it, maybe I'll put it in the outro of this, uh, of this episode. Sure. Yeah, sure. That would be great. We're always looking for new books and literature about, you know, research that's being done and anything we can learn about it. We're always looking for new sources. Where, uh, where do you guys find most of your information for, uh, you know, pirate event of the day? You know, we've got quite an extensive collection of, of books. It has a lot of dates and stuff in it. So that's great. Hey, but it, you know, the, I've, when I've looked for things like this and I, and I have looked for things like this, it always feels like there's a gap somewhere that there's. So the fact that you're able to find something for each and every day, I think that's pretty remarkable. There are a few days that, you know, that get missed out. So if I have an opening and a date, I'll just put that in there because it may say um, mid-February or early March or whatever. So I'll just kind of put that in one of the dates that I might have a gap for. And then if we don't, then I'll post something that says nothing important on this date. And I'll post a picture of uh, pirate art. That's good. <laughs> That's great. Now, uh, have you managed to, uh, I haven't got to see a lot of the videos. So did you manage to still do a fair number of rum reviews? Yeah, we've done a ton of rum, rum reviews. We, uh, we've actually had an old episodes lost because of rum. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Well, we started out uh, several years back trying, you know, some basic rums and we just didn't really get past, you know, doing a little bit like that and doing just a few sips and a few drinks. But it, recently we tried, you know, some uh, more higher quality rums and we thought, wow, you know, these are these are pretty good drinks and maybe we should uh, talk about it to people. Maybe other people are interested in it. And that's why we kind of came up with the idea for doing these rum reviews. What would you say is your, uh, uh, maybe, maybe both of you have a, a top two or three that you could mention. Between the two of us, you would find that Kirk and Sweeney 23 is the top of our list and Bumbu, B-U-M-B-U. Got, that's a cool bottle too. <laughs> It's yes, nice, we a fun bottle. Yeah, we uh, we discovered that when we were down visiting family in Texas, Corpus Christi, and we went into a liquor store looking for something, and we were just walking around. We saw it. We thought, "Hey, let's try it." And Tom's sister ended up drinking half the bottle. <laughs> and then we came back up where we live and started hunting it, and couldn't find it, and got the liquor store to carry it. We went to another liquor store and got them to carry it. So we've gotten quite a few of them to carry it in our neck of the woods and people are quite happy. That's great. Yeah. I think it's at, um, BevMo here in uh, California. Oh, if you could get it, you're lucky to get it because a lot of people can't find it throughout the country. You know, we had to get, I think we're probably single-handedly responsible for getting it just introduced <laughs> into the state of Colorado by harassing and haranguing liquor stores in the area to carry it. Now we find it everywhere. That's great. That is, that's awesome. We never found it before. I'll tell you that until, until Delaney got on the phone and started harassing these people and said, why don't you carry this rum? Why don't you carry this rum? And now they carry it. That's great. I'm glad it was just through uh, harassing and not so much from just the sheer quality of things that you bought. <laughs> no, no. Cause otherwise I'd say, you know, how's, how's your liver? <laughs> it's actually pretty good so i hear ice who's eat, who's drinking already that's me okay <laughs> <laughs> actually actually we're teetotalers we drink a lot of tea <laughs> oh good good i uh 
It's funny. I, I had, um, before the kickoff of me taking over this show from the previous host, I, there was a long pause and the pause was a result of the fact that I had, I had had a, a heart issue. I got a pacemaker, which came, I, I didn't expect it, but I got it. And, um, so my alcohol consumption has, uh, gone down considerably. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they, they, somebody had said, I don't even think it was one of my doctors, but somebody had said, you know, sometimes alcohol will fool your pacemaker, which has a defibrillator in it, will fool it into thinking that you should be, uh, jolted. And that oh. was enough. <laughs> that was enough for me to go, you know, I might cut down. I might just a little, I might. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't, uh, okay. I guess I could see that, but, uh, yeah, you might want to cut down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have had alcohol since getting this, but the, and there is a part of me that feels like, yeah, let's try this one, uh, and just see, <laughs> just see if it's going to happen. So, well, you know, uh, a little, a couple little tots won't hurt. I don't think. <laughs> I don't think so. So far, no. So far, yeah. no. I'll let you know. You It'll be a great episode <laughs> at some point. Um, this is great. I uh, so now so you said the Facebook page and you have your YouTube page. Do you also have a website or is it just those two sources? Right now, you know, we also have Instagram and Twitter, which I don't do a whole lot on because I do I do the tech. Tom will call me in the show as you know captain, but I refer to myself as quartermaster because the quartermaster is really the most important person. And who ran the <laughs> ship when when not in battle? It was the quartermaster. Well, I pretty much run the ship, and then when we're doing the videos, then. He starts them off and ends them. So he's the captain there, and I'm the quartermaster or the admin. But we want to do a website. I've kind of toyed around with one. Uh, we have a friend of ours who offered, but I said, I want to do it on the cheap. And he says, yeah, you know, I'll charge you 700 bucks. I'm like, no, I said on the cheap. <laughs> That's piracy right there. <laughs> I used to do web Man. design, and so I'm trying to refigure out how to do it and get everything laid out to what I want and what's aesthetically pleasing and – We'll see. We'll see. How long? Uh, how long before doing this show over uh, a year ago? How much before that had you started doing pirate stuff? I have been doing when I was a kid. Um, I had our family had this big, huge orchard, and I had a treehouse in that orchard that I invited all the kids over, and we played pirates. We tied bandanas around our heads. So I've been doing pirates since I was in about third grade. And then I started doing Renaissance fairs and doing piracy. And then when I met Tom, he didn't ever really dress up at Ren fairs or anything. And the second year he went, we he started dressing up and we would do noble and we would do pirates. And we've just kind of gone into pirates because the noble guard is one, it's really hard to clean. And two, it's <laughs> really hot. <laughs> sure. And in Colorado in our, in our fair season, it's June and July and August. So you're hitting a hundred degree temperatures and when you're in heavy velvet and seven layers of clothing, it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. So piracy is a lot cooler. We can strip down and just be in, you know, shirts and, and breeches and boots and be comfortable. Yeah. I, it's funny. I, my desire almost every time I go to some pirate festival is to have all the stuff on and you know, you get the boots and the pants and the, you got the, <laughs> the frock coat and the vest. And by about the end of the first afternoon, I'm like, you know, eh, pants and a shirt seem just enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stick with functionality, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. a nice cotton, nice cool cotton shirt and some loose pants and a ah, nice hat. And that's about as far as you, you need to go. <laughs> I do. I love the pageantry though. I, I mean, that's, I think why a lot of us do this is we like oh, yeah. all that extra, all the accoutrement and, and, you know, everything that you can do it. But yeah, after, especially if you're including it with drinking, uh, after a while, you're like, you know, I think being drunk with a flintlock and a pair of pants is probably all I need to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 A cheap sword and a nice, you know, kind of a cocked hat <laughs> and you're fine. <laughs> right. Right. Or a cheap companion, whatever you got, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I've sure enjoyed talking to you, folks. Uh, in a now, the the website, the the excuse me, the Facebook page is the Pirate Round, right? Correct, and it's P Y R A T E, not P I. We spell it the old archaic way, and the way they did back then. Sure. 
Yeah, no, that that's great. And uh, I love your origin story of that name. I think it's just just perfect. It's great thinking. And especially if nobody, if they don't know it when they see it, uh, hopefully hearing this interview when they now hear the meaning, I think it'll have an extra impact, which I think is great. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't really talk about the pirate round. You know, they, they always focus on the Caribbean, you know. Teach, you know, Blackbeard or Thatch and Calico Jack and Woods Rogers and, you know, all that area. And, but they tend to forget about Henry Avery and Thomas too, and uh, Oliver Levasseur and uh, Christopher Condent and many of them other ones who went around the pirate round to attack the mogul ships in India. Right. Uh, some of the largest pirate halls and treasure halls ever made took place there. And some of those men would walk away with enough money to last them the rest of their lives, no matter how they spent it. You know, they might have come out of there with a, you know, a hundred thousand pounds in, in that time money, which would be, you know, 10 or $15 million today. You know, yeah. imagine if, you know, one strike, everybody always talks about like, you know, the one big strike we can get that'll make, you know, make us rich forever. And some of those pirates walked away with, you know, enough money to be, to make them as rich as lords. Right. Some, of course, uh, some of the other pirates, they uh, may have not a huge strike, but fortunately, their life was very short. So they did make enough to live the rest of their lives. Yeah. Right. That's one way to put it. <laughs> it, was, it was just the next couple of weeks. That's the downside. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all perspective, right? It's yeah. true. Well, thank you so much for uh, for sharing this time, and uh, I'll make sure that when we put up the notes for the episode that we include uh, links to your guys' page so that they can find you and enjoy all the stuff you have to offer. Great. Thanks. We appreciate it. And that was my interview with Thomas and Delaney Anderson of the Pirate Round. I hope you enjoyed it. I sure enjoyed spending time with them. I uh, Just to let you know, if you noticed a couple of little blips. We had a, a number of uh, audio issues that I was very proud in the way I edited it that you probably only were a little aware of it, but there they were. And uh, hopefully they didn't become too distracting for you. Um, yeah, that was them and they're great. And uh, that's the show for today. I hope uh, if you have some folks that you'd like to hear me interview, you'd like to have come on the show, hit me up, go to our webpage and uh, hit the contact us button with a name and some contact information so that I can interview those nice people or that nice person. And that would be very helpful because I'm always looking for somebody great to interview connected to the pirate world. Folks, please remember uh, the real treasure in life is friends and family, love and laughter. And I want you to go out and get you some. I want you to spend some time with some people you love and have a good time with them. And that's the important thing. Everything else, everything else is just secondary. That time we spend with those people we care about, that's the real treasure. I'm sure glad you spent time with me. Uh, It makes me happy, makes the show move forward, makes it worth doing. Have a great time. My name is Nick Hoffman. This is Under the Crossbones. We'll see you next time.